Welcome to The Advocates, I'm Aaron Dean. For the first time, Target CEO is explaining why the company removed LGBTQ plus merchandise and displays during Pride Month. Target has celebrated Pride Month every June for the last 10 years. Brian Cornell says that this year, employees often face attacks and threats from customers over items for trans people. Cornell also says that employees raise concerns about safety. By comparison, Bud Light received similar backlash when they partnered with trans influencer Dylan Mulvaney. A new warning from the DOJ and the FBI says that hate crimes in the U.S. are on the rise. FBI records show a rise in anti-Muslim incidents starting in 2015 and anti-Semitic crimes had already been on the rise before October 7th. They increased 36% between 2021 and 2022. Now, the ADL says that it has recorded 312 incidents since October 7th. That's up 388%. As I see in my daily threat briefings, there has been a significant increase in the volume and frequency of threats against Jewish, Muslim, and Arab communities across our country. We are focusing our efforts on confronting and disrupting illegal threats wherever they arise. The Justice Department has no tolerance for violence or unlawful threats of violence fueled by anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. The DOJ recently released $38 million to help local communities prevent hate crimes. The White House is developing a new national strategy to combat Islamophobia. The Domestic Policy Council and the National Security Council will develop a plan to protect Muslims and those who may appear Muslim from discrimination, hate, bigotry, and violence. The initiative comes as Israel continues its war with Hamas. Some of the nation's largest Muslim American groups have denounced the president's approach to the conflict. Some of that anti-Muslim hate and anti-Semitism are being seen on college campuses. The DOJ is monitoring threats made to colleges across the country, including Cornell University. One student told the education secretary that some Jewish students are worried about wearing Jewish symbols on their bags and clothing. I have stickers on my water bottle, I have keychains on my backpack that I am I have debated many times removing because I'm afraid of somebody attacking me from behind because they see um, Hebrew on my backpack. I'm not Jewish, but I'm appalled and horrified at what I'm hearing across the country. And I want to tell you directly, we've got your back. Queer populations in some countries like Afghanistan often face brutal and barbaric punishment for who they love. Many are traveling to escape and are seeking asylum elsewhere. Frank and Joe Rodriguez are two brothers who are helping with those extractions, and they told me exactly why they do it. Joe and Frank, welcome to the show. How are you both? We're good. Doing well. Good, good. Well, um, Frank, I'll start with you. Can you share with us how, you know, you all began in this work when it comes to bringing LGBTQ plus Afghan refugees to the U.S. and Canada? Uh, it was completely by accident. Uh, we were with my parents and um, it was right when the when the evacuation was happening, when the U.S. was pulling out of Afghanistan. And my father ended up going to the emergency room for we didn't know what was going on with him. And so we were in a hotel room, my brother and I, and he followed a Twitter account about uh, Afghan LGBT issues. And he sent a message on the Twitter account, his first one saying, are you okay? And the answer back was no. And he said, I just got an answer back. He said, no. And that moment started two years of this journey, which is really my brother, um, really mostly about him and what he's done to get people out of Afghanistan. Yeah, and Joe, kind of for background um, for our audience, describe the situation in Afghanistan um, with the Taliban and how LGBTQ plus people there are under attack and they're seeking right. a better life. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the turn of the century, right before 9-11, the Taliban were in um, power and they were executing LGBTQ people as well as women um, rights um, folks in soccer stadiums and places like this. Then 9-11 happened, the U.S. arrived, and um, um, that sort of execution and things, even though there was a lot of uh, uh, 
of homophobia, those things weren't happening so much. Um, sometimes there might be an honor killing of uh, LGBTQ folks by their family members, but that became more of a rarity. And um, when the Taliban took over in 2021, they reimposed Sharia law, which calls for the execution of LGBT people by stoning and burying alive, all sorts of means that are just uh, horrendous. So right now, the situation in Afghanistan, and we're hearing this on a daily basis, is our people are being arrested quietly, and they're being uh, tortured, raped, and very often murdered. And we think from what we can tell in working with people like Rainbow Railroad and others, we think we're losing about 200 to 300 people a month who never reappear. So this is a state-sponsored murder of our folks. And you know, how do you all go about, what, what's the process like of getting someone in that kind of situation out of that, out of their country? And I'm sure there has to be some roadblocks and challenges that come along the way. You, uh, I think that I think that the, the first thing that happens is um, through a whole network of people they contact. Uh, so they kind they're on Rainbow Railroad's list. I mean, people who are in in Afghanistan are desperate to get out. The LGBTQ people are they 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 know that their survival depends on them getting out of the country. So they're very motivated and they're trying to uh, reach out and through channels. Um, uh, we hear about different individuals a lot of times through people that we already have uh, a relationship with, and then uh, we work to to. Uh, well, Joe will explain the process better than I can. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, we we have two challenges: one, getting people to an interim country where they're safer. They might not be completely safe, but they're much safer. I mean, um, you know, there's nothing worse than being. Uh, with the Taliban hot on your trail, arresting you and torturing you. So we right. try to get them to a nearby country. But the biggest challenge is um, is finding countries that will take them in. Um, and there's very few countries in the world that will do so. Right now, Canada has taken in 1,100 LGBTQ people out of 40,000 Afghans, uh, which is huge. And, uh, you know, LGBTQ make up about 2% of the total Afghans that they've taken out. And the US is starting to do some of this, but uh, they don't have a program that's really designed for this. They have an, um, a program now called US Welcome Corps that's beginning to help. And then the last country that we've been working with them recently um, that we're super excited about is Germany. Germany has opened its doors to up to 1200 LGBTQ Afghans a year. And this would be the largest evacuation of LGBTQ people in history. So we're working with Germany, Canada, and when we can, um, the U.S. And you know, you know, um, our team, we read the story of Muhammad and we were very moved by it. And for our audience, can you um, give them a little insight on who Muhammad is and their journey coming into America? Well, uh, one of our, our folks uh, uh, was working um, for a, an airline and he was um, he, he was a flight attendant and um, traveling all around the world or all around the Middle East with this airline and he uh, he had an opportunity to help evacuate um, a bunch of Afghan people in the closing days during the airlift and then at the end of this time he was asking the US military if he could be evacuated uh, uh, to the United States. So they put him on a military jet and he was sent to the UAE and he spent about 10 months there. And after about a month being in the sort of like uh, uh, detention camp for LGBT, well, for Afghan refugees, he was, uh, he was thinking, you know, I'm gonna just be doing nothing here people, I can't let people know that I'm LGBT because the other Afghans might harm me. So what he ended up doing was volunteering in the hospital and helping people fill out their forms so they could get to safety in some Western country. And then he shared his identity and story with uh, the NGO that was working at the um, uh, refugee facility. And they contacted one of our, uh, one of our partners 
who's gotten many LGBT people to safety throughout the years. And he eventually came to the United States as under uh, as a humanitarian asylum program. Thanks so much for watching The Advocates. Download the app in the Apple or Google Play Store to stream us live. And you can even subscribe to our YouTube channel. For The Advocate Channel, I'm Aaron Dean.